In this edition of Airborne, the Red Bull Stratus Project breaks the world freefall record. Yes, you can get a ready-made RV-12 soon, and the FAA boss promises less complicated aircraft certification. I'm Ashley Hale, welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. No baby steps here. After flying to an altitude of 128,097 feet in a capsule suspended below a helium-filled balloon, Felix Baumgartner completed a record-breaking jump for the ages from the edge of space. Sunday, exactly 65 years after Chuck Yeager first broke the sound barrier, flying in an experimental rocket-powered airplane. The 43-year-old Austrian skydiving expert also broke two other world records, highest freefall and highest manned balloon flight, leaving the one for the longest freefall to his project mentor, Colonel Joe Kittinger, who acted as Capcom for the mission. Baumgartner landed safely with his parachute in the New Mexico desert. After jumping out of his space capsule and plunging back towards Earth, hitting a maximum speed of over 833 miles per hour through the near vacuum of the stratosphere, before being slowed by the atmosphere later during his 4-minute, 19-second freefall. Baumgartner's jump lasted a total of 9 minutes and 3 seconds. Millions of people around the world watched his ascent and jump live on television broadcast and live stream on the internet. At one point during his free fall, Baumgartner appeared to spin rapidly, but he quickly regained control and moments later opened his parachute as members of the ground crew cheered and viewers around the world heaved a sigh of relief. Vans Aircraft announced that it will offer a factory-built version of its RV-12 LSA next year. The aircraft will be built by Synergy Air of Eugene, Oregon, which currently offers a builder assistance program for its kit builders. The initial factory run will consist of 12 SLSA airplanes with all the bells and whistles, offered as a signature edition model. One of these first airplanes will set the buyer back $115,000, but the company expects to offer a base model in the future, starting at about $105,000. Vans has a fleet of some 7,900 kit-built airplanes flying, so offering a ready-to-fly aircraft is quite a departure for the company. Nearly 200 RV-12 kits have been completed and flown as EAB or Experimental LSA airplanes, and sales manager Gus Funnel said that experience provided the base of knowledge the company needed to make incremental improvement in the airplane for the SLSA. The airplane is powered by a Rotax 100 horsepower ULS engine. A Dynon Skyview EFIS will be standard on the SLSA, as will the Garmin SL40 COM radio, Flightcom Stereo Intercom, 406 megahertz emergency locator transmitter, Flightline interior, and LED lighting. The Signature Edition airplanes will also come with wheel pants, ADS-B capability, two-axis autopilot, and other premium touches. Acting FAA Administrator Michael Huerta said the agency is working towards reducing the time it takes to certify new general aviation aircraft. Tom Patton has that story. In a speech to an audience made up of many of the country's biggest GA manufacturers, Huerta said he has put in motion a plan that could eventually mean sharp reductions in the costs and time associated with the certification of new GA airplanes. Speaking to the Wichita Aero Club, Huerta said that the Aviation Rulemaking Committee, or ARC, charged with looking at Part 23, is taking a fresh look at how the agency certifies general aviation aircraft. Huerta said that the committee has suggested switching from criteria based on an airplane's weight and propulsion to criteria that correspond to the aircraft's performance and its complexity. 
where it just said the FAA would continue to exercise the authority to certify whether or not an airplane design met the standard, but industry consensus standards that would apply anywhere in the world would be used. Huerta said, quote, these changes will allow the aviation industry to adopt new technologies more quickly, and this means enhanced safety for everyone, end quote. In the speech, Huerta also talked about the use of non-required safety equipment in GA airplanes, saying, quote, in the last decade, the experimental aircraft fleet has doubled, and the certified GA fleet has decreased by 10%. That's partly because the experimental segment of the industry is where a recreational aviator can more afford to buy a new aircraft, and the owner can then add safety equipment that's much newer than in the traditional fleet." End quote. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Check your piggy banks, folks, because it might be time to break the bank. A hurricane fighter aircraft, like one of the many that defended British shores during World War II's Battle of Britain, will be the star attraction at the bottom sale of collectors motor cars and automobilia at Mercedes-Benz World Brooklands, the spiritual home of the hurricane, in Weybridge, Surrey, UK, on Monday, December 3rd. The hurricane, the Royal Air Force's first monoplane fighter, had its finest hour during that battle, where it shot down more enemy aircraft than its famous service partner, the Spitfire. Brooklands, where the Bonhams sale will take place, has its own history with the aircraft. It was assembled and first flown in prototype form there in 1935. And altogether, more than 3,000 hurricanes were produced on site. This aircraft is capable of a range of 900 miles and a max speed of 322 miles per hour. It's offered for sale with an estimated value of 1.4 to 1.7 million pounds or 2.2 to 2.7 million dollars US. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able to put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird flight simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or our podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. Well, no little green men yet, but the first Martian rock NASA's Curiosity rover has reached out to touch presents a more varied composition than expected from previous missions. The rock also resembles some unusual rocks from Earth's interior. The rover team used two instruments on Curiosity to study the chemical makeup of the football-sized rock. The results support some surprising recent measurements and provide an example of why identifying rock's composition is such a major emphasis of the mission. Rock compositions tell stories about unseen environments and planetary processes. This rock is a close match in chemical composition to an unusual but well-known type of igneous rock found in many volcanic provinces on Earth, said Edward Stolper of the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California, who is a Curiosity co-investigator. With only one Martian rock of this type, it's difficult to know whether the same processes were involved, but it's a reasonable place to start thinking about its origin. The FAA has approved the type certificate for the S-76D helicopter, moving the aircraft forward to its highly anticipated delivery 
and to the medium-sized marketplace. The FAA signed the certificate on October 12th, capping an intensive flight test program to introduce the S-76D. The S-76D helicopter has a current backlog approaching a half billion dollars and is expected to begin deliveries later this quarter. The S-76D helicopter is the latest in the family of popular S-76 helicopters manufactured by Sikorsky. There have been more than 800 S-76 helicopters delivered to the global fleet since 1979, contributing daily to a growing 6 million plus flight hours. While we hated to see it happen, the California Science Center has taken delivery of its space shuttle. Endeavor was towed 12 miles through the streets of Los Angeles over the weekend to the museum, which will open the permanent exhibit on October 30th. The truck behind a truck began Friday, inching along Martin Luther King Boulevard in LA. And it was not without its challenges, according to a report appearing on KABC television. The shuttle reportedly came within an inch of several obstacles along the way, and the procession was halted late Saturday night when a small tree that had first been thought would not be a problem had to be removed. More than a million people reportedly lined the route over the weekend to watch the procession. It's Tuesday and time for another installment of our Aero Video of the Week. It's definitely uh, some sort of turbo failure or, you know, pressurized line that's gone on that. Uh, I've also lost heat, so uh, canopy is fogging up in here pretty good. Visibility may be a challenge uh, for the landing, but I'll do my best to scrub her with my arm as I get in a little closer. Hopefully it's warm enough to clear that up for me. This week, look and listen as a high-performance experimental aircraft copes with engine failure in IMC. The synthetic vision-equipped pilot and bird survive to tell the tale. But we dare you to listen to the actual audio of the incident without getting serious chills down your spine. Finally, today on Airborne, a 20-year-old who admitted shooting into an LAPD helicopter in 2011 has been sentenced to 25 years in prison. Danny Anthony Lopez, who was 18 at the time of the incident, was sentenced by Superior Court Judge Martin Herskovitz after he pleaded no contest to two counts of assault on a peace officer with a semi-automatic firearm. Deputy District Attorney Michael Blake with the Crimes Against Peace Officers Unit said Lopez admitted opening fire on the police helicopter, striking it and forcing it to make an emergency landing at Van Nuys Airport. No one was injured inside the helo during the April 24, 2011 incident. Lopez fired on the police helicopter shortly after 6 a.m. near Satakoy Street and Dinsmore Avenue. He was arrested about an hour later. Well, that's our program for Tuesday, October 16th. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're airborne with Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again this Friday with another edition of Airborne.